My name is Fernando Rojo, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at BeatGig. We're a marketplace for booking artists. You can think of it like Airbnb for live music. Today, I'm going to talk about using React Native with Next.js. My goal with this talk is to convince you that React Native is the best way to build a UI, even if you're only making a website. One year ago, we started building our product from scratch, and I decided to use React Native with Next.js to build the front end. In the time since, we have shipped over 100 screens. All of the code lives in a single monorepo. Our product works on web, iOS, and Android with full feature parity. This is all with one person building and designing the front end. As a result, we have grown from zero to over 10 million in sales in under one year. Thanks to our cross-platform stack, we can iterate rapidly and ship features daily. Our number one priority is reducing the time from idea to deployment. And React Native is our greatest instrument in doing so. Combine it with Next.js and you can deliver an amazing user experience on web. Now, React Native with Next.js is a relatively new stack. So I faced a few issues along the way. My plan with this talk is to break down each issue and show you how we solve them. We'll look at navigation, animations, responsive design systems, platform specific features, monorepo support, and more. Let's jump in. The biggest difference in structure between a React Native app and a Next.js website is navigation. So let's see how it works. To the left, I have the BeatGig website, and on the right, the iPhone app. Let's compare what happens when I open some artist profiles. Okay, here we have it open on the website. I'll do the same on the app. Looks basically the exact same. I'll go back and let's do one more. I'll open BOB on the website and now on the app. So let's compare what happened. On the website, we have at BOB here in the URL. On the iPhone app, there's obviously no URL. And the only real difference is that on the iPhone app, I can swipe back here and I got this stack transition in. So I'll go back and I'll go back here on the website too. The key thing to take away here is the design is mostly shared and the logic is fully shared between platforms, but we still match the user's expectations based on the platform they're using. Let's see how we do it. This part is really cool. We're gonna use the same screens across Next.js and React Native. Our first step is to create a shared artist screen component. I'll expect every file in the screens folder to be shared across platform. Next, I'll create a Next.js page at pages slash artist slash slug, and I'll import that same artist screen component. All we have to do is default export it, and our artist screen is now working on Next.js. For the search screen, I'll create a shared search screen component, import it in pages slash search, and default export it. If you use Next Router, this should look really familiar. We now have our React Native pages rendering on Next.js. The missing piece is, how do we use the same screens in the React Native iPhone and Android app? Here we're looking at app.tsx. React Native uses this file as a single entry point. Rather than use file system routing, we're going to create a stack from React Navigation. Here I've imported Create Native Stack Navigator, which does that for us. I'm also going to import the same screen components, which we just use for our Next.js pages. Now I have an empty navigator and the only missing piece is to add our screens. And there we have it. We now have our two screens uniquely identified by the name prop, search and artist. And the component prop tells us which component to render. This is what the final code looks like. The only difference is that I added navigation container, which is the provider for React Navigation. Let's recap where we just shared some code. First, I import the shared artist screen component in app.tsx for React Native. I then pass artist screen to React Navigation's stack via the component prop. To use the same screen in Next.js, 
All I have to do is import it in pages slash artist slash slug and default export it. And there we go. You now know how to share screens between a React Native app and a Next.js website. The question is, how do we move between screens? If you're on the search page and you want to open an artist page, how do you do it? Can you just use the next link or Next.js's router push? Or is there another way? Let's take a look. I made a library called Expo Next React Navigation, which lets you share all your navigation code between Next.js and React Native. This is what it looks like. It's very similar to Next. It has a link component and a use routing hook. You can create a custom link like this to open an artist. And if you need more customization, you can use the web prop if the route name from native doesn't match your path on web. Unlike Next Router, it uses params instead of query, which does the same thing. Reading in our params is also very similar to Next. This is what it looks like on Next. And with Expo Next React Navigation, instead of query, we just use params and everything else is basically the same. In the future, I want to have an API like this, where it's fully shared between Next and React Native, but there are still some things in the way. And if you want to help, you can check out this issue I opened on the repository called the Future API. And I would love to hear your thoughts and get your contributions. Next, let's talk animations. Coming from a web background, I always loved using simple things like CSS transitions and more advanced libraries like React Spring and Framer Motion. In the past year, there have been some incredible innovations for performant animations in React Native with the introduction of Reanimated 2. That said, before I even started using React Native Web, something I felt I was missing in React Native when it came to performant animations was a simple API. In 2019, this feature request was opened on the Framer Motion repo for React Native support. It was one of those issues that got a ton of attention, a lot of upvotes, but was outside of the scope of what Framer Motion was focused on, which was just the web. This inspired me to write an RFC in October of 2020 for a simple cross-platform animation library for React Native and React Native Web. I wanted to borrow a lot of the cool features from Framer Motion, like mount animations and automatic transitions and I ultimately decided to build my own library called Modi, and I launched it on Twitter about eight months ago. In the time since, Modi has gotten almost 2,000 stars and has gained quite a bit in popularity. This is what it looks like to use Modi. You get a Modi view and a Modi text component. You can use the from prop for mount animations, and anything you pass to animate will automatically transition, which makes it really easy to animate based on React state. You can also get full control of your animations using the transition prop like Framer Motion. One of my favorite features of Modi is the mount and unmount animations. Under the hood, Modi uses Framer Motion's animate presence to bring this feature to React Native for the first time. In fact, Matt Perry from Framer Motion recommends Modi as the native compatible alternative. If you want to animate based on hovered or press states, with Modi, it's as simple as passing a function to your animate prop. You can interpolate between hovered and press states and the results will automatically animate without triggering any re-renders. That means we get cross-platform animations that run at 60 frames per second. One of my favorite design patterns is animating a component when someone hovers or presses it. Notice what happens when I hover over the see more link. See that the background turns yellow. And when I hover over an artist, they scale up. Getting this kind of feature parity between a website and an iPhone app would previously be really challenging. But with React Native, React Native Web, and Modi, this parity comes out of the box. To the right, we have the BeatGig iPhone app. Let's see what happens when I press on the See More button. The background also turns yellow, just like the website. And when I press in on the artist as I scroll, they also scale up the exact same way. With Modi, you can also do more advanced interaction-based animations, such as animating the children of a pressable component. If you open the BeatGig website and hover over products in the header, you get this nice dropdown. Each item has a background transition and an icon that animates in or out. This is actually built with Framer Motion and React State, 
because I hadn't launched Modi Interactions yet. But once I shipped this on the website, I wanted to try to remake it with Modi. Here we have the exact same component from Beekig's website built with Modi. What I find interesting is this is a web-only component, and yet implementing it with Modi, which is a React Native library, was a lot simpler than doing so with web libraries. I think this is a common side effect of building with React Native and React Native Web. Rather than focus on platform-based implementation, you think strictly about the UI. And as a result, you come up with APIs that are a lot simpler than what probably existed. The code for this dropdown is open source, and I'll link to it at the end of the talk. Next.js is a first-class citizen of Modi. Add Modi to your next transpile modules, add a single polyfill, and you're good to go. Let's look at one final animation example, animating based on scroll position. On the right, we have the Beekig iPhone app. To the left, the mobile website. Notice that the header fades in when I scroll down. The animation code here is shared 100% cross-platform, and there's actually no special library in play here. This is using the vanilla animated API from React Native. For simple things like scroll animations, this API is quite easy to use and can get you great performance. Next, let's talk theming and responsive design. Back in 2017, I was running an e-commerce sneaker brand called Patos. I wanted to make some custom edits to my Shopify website, so I started learning CSS and JavaScript, and it didn't take long to fall in love with both. Soon enough, I considered myself a web developer. I was using CSS all the time. So when I started styling in React Native, I had some mixed feelings. To start, let's compare what it looks like to style in CSS and React Native. Next, I'll discuss the pros and cons of React Native's styling system. And finally, I'll show you what we do. Here we have a component class name written in CSS. And at the bottom, we have the equivalent in React Native. React Native has a built-in stylesheet API. Rather than use class name, we'll pass this to the component directly using the style prop. If I want to use multiple styles, I just pass an array. In this case, I'm forwarding props.style. The order of the styles is determined by their order in the array, which is a lot more predictable than CSS. I can also do conditional styles. In this case, I'm only applying props.style if props.is enabled is true. Finally, if you want to add dynamic styles, you can do that by putting them in line like this. For a deeper understanding of styling in React Native, I recommend checking out the docs, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of the differences with CSS. Next, let's look at the pros and cons. First, the pros. There are no global styles in React Native. At first, I viewed this as an annoying limitation, but it's actually crucial. If you want to know the styles applying to a component, you just look at the style prop. It's dead simple. And there's no risk of accidentally setting a global style that has side effects on other components. Similarly, there are no nested styles like there are in CSS. All styles are scoped to a single component, and the logic is handled on the JavaScript side, making each component incredibly predictable. React Native also doesn't have pseudo elements. If you want to track a component's focus state, you use the onFocus prop instead of the CSS selector. This is a lot safer, as it maintains your components as a function of their state, and you can come back to it months later and know exactly what's going on. Finally, in React Native, there are no issues with import order of styles. With CSS, you can cause many bugs simply by the position in which you import a file. On the other hand, in React Native, if you want to know the order of styles that are applying to a component, you just look at the style prop. There are no cascading styles, no nested styles, no global styles. Everything is scoped to a single component, which means your component-based design system is scalable. For a long time, I thought I loved CSS, and part of me still does. But once I started styling with React Native, it was pretty hard to go back. The level of predictability and simplicity lets you move so quickly and keeps you from getting bogged down by little CSS bugs and platform-based issues. One interesting thing is the Stylesheet API from React Native Web is actually a highly optimized CSS in JS solution. 
If you want to see how companies like Twitter use this on their website, I highly recommend this talk by the creator of React Native Web, Nicholas Gallagher. Okay, now the cons of styling in React Native. React Native doesn't have CSS grid. This isn't the biggest issue in the world, but it would just be nice to have it. Next, React Native doesn't have the concept of media queries. So responsive design can be a bit challenging. You have to actually use JavaScript to track screen dimensions in render. In fact, React Native Web actually recommends not using media queries. Instead, they take the position that you should render different component trees altogether based on screen size or view container size. So what's the verdict? I've spent a few years building with both CSS and React Native, and ultimately, the low-level styling API provided by React Native and React Native Web is better than that of CSS. The level of predictability and scalability in a component-based design system is too hard to beat. Now, there are some missing pieces, and in these cases, I think it's up to us to build libraries to add in features like theming and responsive design. Let's take a look at how we solve these things for BeatGig. In 2019, this feature request for React Native support was opened on the Chakra UI repo. I thought this was pretty exciting because I wanted a library like Chakra for React Native and React Native Web with unstyled components. I ultimately decided to build my own library called Dripsy. Dripsy is a set of responsive, unstyled UI primitives for React Native and React Native Web based on a theme. This is what it looks like to use Dripsy. It's heavily inspired by theme UI from React. On the left, we have our theme, and on the right, we can style a component using the SX prop. So I'll try adding a background color, and here it pulls values straight from my theme. If I wanna make a value responsive, such as padding, all I need to do is pass an array. Here it'll use the third scale on mobile devices and zero on any screen bigger than that. We now have a way to use theming and responsive design across platforms, creating a consistent user experience no matter where your users are. Next, let's talk platform-specific features. Every now and then, I come across a feature from web that doesn't yet exist in React Native. Two good examples are anchor tags for scrolling down a page and URL query parameters. Let's take a look at how we use these features in a cross-platform app, and then, I'll show you how you can make your own. Something I love about HTML is how easy it is to scroll from one part of the page to another using an anchor tag. The issue is React Native doesn't have anchor tags. So to get around it, I built my own library called Anchor. Anchor lets you scroll to any arbitrary component inside of any scroll view. It works cross-platform with the exact same API. I found this to be especially useful when a user submits a form and I want to scroll down to the errors. To the left, we have the BeatGig website and on the right, the iPhone app. Let's see what happens if I submit the form with missing fields. Notice that it turns red and scrolls to the correct field. Let's do the same thing on the iPhone app and the same thing happens. So I'll enter my offer amount here and I'll do the same thing on the app and I'll hit submit again. And now it takes me down to the date. So this time I'll set a future date, say December 2nd, and I'll set one on the app as well. All right, so I'll submit one more time, and it takes me down to performance length. So I'll fill this in, do it on both. And now we have the app submitting on both for offers to Loud Luxury. Here we were able to use anchors to nudge users along the way and make the form experience much more enjoyable, even when there are errors. Next, let's take a look at using URL query parameters across platforms. Something I find really cool is using query parameters as our React state. So I made a hook called useParam, which lets us do just that. What's cool is this hook actually works cross-platform. On web, it uses next router to get the query parameters, and on native, it uses normal React state. Here I have a name and a set name returned by useParam, which works just like useState. The first step is to set the actual name of the query parameter, which in this case is just name, and that is pulling from the types up here. When I call setName, it should set it in the query parameters and use that as my state. So I'll try that here. 
And there we go. Now it's rendering this name. It's in the query parameters. And if I refresh, I maintain my exact same state. Let's try adding a clear name function. I'll just set the name to null. And then I'll add a button. All right, so I'll go ahead and click clear name. And now it's back to null. It clears that out of the query parameters, and there's nothing here. Now let's look at a more complicated example using age, which is a number. The reason this is more complicated is because age is a number and query parameters are always strings. So here I have TypeScript complaining. The reason is because I need to parse the value in from the URL string. So in this case, I'll use the parse function, which gives you the value from the query parameters and it expects you to return the type you want. So in this case, I'm gonna return a number based on the query parameter I have, okay? But why is this still upset? Well, what happens on the initial render if you don't set a value? You need to set initial similar to use state from React. And there we have it. We now have an age query parameter, which is a number, gets parsed in from the URL, and also lets you set an initial value if it's undefined on the first render. To recap, parse works similar to a JSON parse, but you can do it by query parameter. Now, if I wanted to have a custom value in here, let's say it was number or hello, in this case, the H type is gonna recognize that parse returns number or hello, but I'll just clear that out. And now age is always going to be a number. This is especially useful if in parse, you want to restrict users to only a specific set of types. For example, you might want it to be a number that's only one, two, or three, and you can handle all that inside of parse. And that is it. This is probably the most useful hook I have, and it's so simple. It works just like React State across platforms, but on web, it lets you manage it all through your query parameters. Next, let's look at writing our own platform-specific code. To run different code based on the platform you're using, import platform from React Native. Using platform.os, you can distinguish between your platform and run different code. Typically, you'll want to provide a fallback for other platforms. Alternatively, you can import different files altogether based on the platform using a .platform extension on a file name. In this case, index.web.ts will be imported on web, and index.ts will be imported on all other platforms and you can do this for as many platforms as you want. In general, I actually recommend against writing platform-specific code directly in your app. In fact, in the Modi docs, I wrote that using platform.os is an anti-pattern. If you find yourself needing to write platform-specific code, chances are you found a good idea for an open source library. Platform inconsistencies should be handled by third-party libraries, so that apps can always build with a single unified API. Next, let's take a look at the monorepo structure for React Native Next.js app. The best way to structure a React Native Next.js app is with a monorepo. Here I have a packages folder and an applications folder. Inside of applications, I have my two separate entry points. Next is just my Next.js app, as you'd expect, and Expo is the React Native app that will run on iOS and Android. Expo provides a set of libraries and services that makes building and deploying with React Native super easy. While it isn't a perfect comparison, in many ways, Expo is to React Native what Next.js is to React. It makes shipping your product into production a way better experience. I highly recommend using Expo for the React Native side. I find this to be pretty uncontroversial. I won't spend too long on this. Instead, at the end of the talk, I'll link to an example monorepo, which you can use as your starter. With React Native, we have an instrument to turn ideas into component-based products quickly. Combine it with Next.js, and we can leverage the best features the web has to offer. But there is still work to be done. And if you want to take part in building the cross-platform stack of the future, I encourage you to follow and reach out to me on Twitter, at Fernando the Rojo. I hope you enjoyed this talk, and I can't wait to see what ideas you have to keep pushing this stack forward. Thank you.